life and bring to bear uh, research from uh, psychology such as the, uh, the concept of familiar strangers um, that, uh, and building very interesting systems around that. Um, he then got lured away to CMU where he was on the faculty at the Human Computer Interaction Institute and even had a, an endowed chair there before uh, we managed to get him back to, to Berkeley a couple of years ago. And now he's been really active in the department here, also in Citrus, where he co-founded and now directs the Citrus Invention Lab and uh, heads the Connected Communities Initiative. And he's also the Chief Learning Officer right next door in the Jacobs Institute. And Eric has a really fascinating group of students who've been envisioning the future of making and the future of wearables. So uh, please welcome Eric Collis. <laughs> Great, thank you, Bjorn. Uh, yeah, it does feel like very, it's obviously very much a homecoming. Plus, uh, I transported all the way across, uh, you know, Hearst Avenue to get over here for for this today. But hey, thank you for being here. I, what I, it's it's actually every time I get a chance to speak, uh, it's always an honor and also um, a great chance to hopefully find some collaborations and get some inspiration. What I'd like to do is use the time to tell you a little bit about. Um, some of the things that Bjorn mentioned, a little bit about uh, some new research in making and some new ideas around wearables. But I want to sort of put forth a little bit of an argument first about a vision and a framing around computer science and around kind of technology and engineering as I see it with uh, intersection with art and with design. And I figure I'd tell a couple stories to kind of illustrate that. And you saw I've also got some demos, so there's some things you get to see along the way. Um, so as Bjorn said, I had this uh, journey for, uh, of coming here, uh, being here as a student, going away, coming back. And what I found is now I have all these different uh, positions, and it's a, it's a great opportunity to interact um, and have impact in different arenas and in different contexts. Now, you all have your own journey here, and all of you are coming from you know, disciplines like computer science and engineering, um, and uh, I think others as well. The idea is how can we leverage those skills? How can we bring in those conversations? And I try to ha have that part of the kind of initial conversation. So first, I got to say something else about me that Bjorn didn't mention. That's me. This was my first computer uh, way back. I was about probably 11 or 12 years old. Uh, that was my old Apple II. And you had more hair. I had a lot more hair. This talk basically progresses with hair. Um, I found it in my parents' garage last summer, and it still works. And I found a piece of code that I wrote uh, a very, very long time ago. So I'll just run it here. So you have to, there's, I have uh, kids. They said, where's the mouse, dad? I go, there is no mouse. It's, it's, you have to type these things out. So I wrote this the piece of code called Eric's House. Um, but it was interesting because I was able to go back. It's funny to remember all these things. But what I want to say is I was thinking about how this is this great basic code, right? So you can kind of see this. But the, this first code was really exploring almost an, a kind of, an idea of a narrative and a storytelling in a very, very subtle but way. So it says structure, it says walls and roof. Let me just also tell you, I'd never seen this in color until last year. Because even when I programmed it, I knew what colors I was using, but I couldn't see them. I didn't have a color monitor. Necessities. Oh. There's a little air tell. little animation. So. Um, so now I'm here, and I, there's a long journey. I'm not going to tell you about that. I want to try to put forth this argument about design and art. And one of the things that I came across was this quote says, imagine something never before done by a, ne by a method never before used whose outcome is unforeseen. I think all of us feel this way in our own research, our own pursuits. And I, I was really kind of inspired. I, I felt a kinship with this. But what sort of surprised me was this, this didn't come from the kind of leading scientists of the day. This was actually a quote from Alan Capra, who was a well-known artist who really developed the happenings and tried to think about how art could happen in everyday places and everyday contexts. Now I'm here. I run this group called the Hybrid Ecologies uh, Lab. 
uh, where I try to think uh, collectively with my students about this hybrid, this idea, and I really draw inspiration from Marshall McLuhan, who says, the hybrid or the meeting of two media is a moment of truth and revelation from which new form is born. I like this idea of thinking about how to bring together hybrid people, hybrid materials, hybrid methods. I think there's a lot of, uh, you know, this is a powerful concept. And for ecologies, of course, things around how computing and technology interacts with us, this kind of abiotic environment, but also the kind of organic materials that we deal with and the kind of ways that we can interact with them. I'm going to just tell you exactly how I do research so we don't have anything like confusing. This is how I feel that a lot of the projects go. We identify some core metaphor in some field. We recognize what's excluded or marginalized. It could be people, it could be a method, it could be a tool, it could be a material. And then we basically invert the metaphor and bring that marginalized object or material to the center and then we build some alternative embodiments. And I, I can see this, trust me, I never figured this out. It was looking back across a lot of projects that I think this is something that I do. And it could, and I think it applies well to what I feel is a very much a Berkeley framing around looking for opportunities to bring people that maybe don't have a voice to some particular context um, or uh, a participation. So I am gonna use uh, three stories to illustrate this connection to art. So the first one is one that Bjorn alluded to, which was I originally was doing robotics here with John Canny. And at the time, if you think about robotics and telepresence really had some specific constraints. For one, it really usually was pretty high cost to get these robots. They were high cost to purchase and use and maintain. They required a highly trained operator that you know, was expected to not damage the equipment and had to have sufficient training. And the tasks were usually these kind of rote repair and inspection tasks. And so using even that kind of formula from the back, and in no way was I thinking this way at the time with John, but what if basically you had robots that were low cost? What if you basically had no training? And what if the task was maybe just hanging out? Okay? And that's what kind of formulated into this idea of these personal roving presence devices. And this is pictures of them actually here in Soda Hall. Um, and it sort of there's a huge number of questions that resulted from that about how should they be constructed. There's kinematics. But really, for me, the interesting thing became the social issues of what new kinds of ways you could communicate across a distance when you had a physical body, a bit of sort of limited one. Yes? Uh, that thing on the left seems to be floating in uh, midair. Yes, though we first made blimps that were actually filled with helium, and they floated around. Um, and they, it was just at the kind of point where you could get the electronics small enough and you could have, now I realize what's surprising, this is 25 years ago, but back like now, these are things you would buy in, a, in like a sky mall, right? You just purchase this thing. But back then it was pretty hard to get all the electronics to operate. And um, also from a robotics standpoint, blimps have this property that in this case that had a speaker on it, so you had two-way audio and you could cruise up to people, but it was very, um, an out-of-body experience, to, or out-of-blimp experience, I guess, to hear this thing come up to you and start talking. You'd recognize the voice, but it didn't look like the person that it was. Furthermore, it was very hard to stay stationary. It would start to drift, and you're basically in a fluid, right? So there were, you know, gyros on board and various other, you know, closed-loop kind of control mechanisms to try to stabilize it, but still. The idea was how great to get out of the obstacle avoidance. You would just cruise right across the audience here, but it also created very strange effects because you could hover and kind of sneak up on people, hop over barriers, things like that. One did get stuck in uh, Soda Hall one time. So yeah, so first we developed these sort of blimps that you could drive around and, and you would have a remote web control and you could actually have not just telepresence, we're interested in how does the body represent itself? What is it like to actually engage with someone? But you can see there's many things to talk about, but one is this, there's not two-way video, so it's a different kind of um, unequal experience. And so we started to explore how that might change with some very simple ground-based devices. And we built lots of iterations of them. Um, this is sort of like a kind of uh, repertoire of them. We brought it, these to SIGGRAPH, we brought them to different uh, trade shows. We studied their, the way that they were interacted with. You can see even, well, 
there's some, you know, flying around campus, but this was at SIGGRAPH. You can imagine there's a voice coming out of that. So people are like, who, I, I, I think I'm talking about, I went to the job area. I'm like, are there jobs here? What do you guys, what's posted? What's new or something? Um, it's unclear if that woman's running from me or like interested in talking, right? So he's like, I don't know what this is. There's, I don't want to be seen. But we also looked at how it would be used for kind of remote repaired inspection. And um, now, it was a sort of complicated thing at the time because there was a lot of, you know, onboard electronics, embedded controls. Now, this is kind of all boiled down to solutions that look like this. You just buy some small, already existing, you know, AV system that does all of your video conferencing and maybe you have some small control. Someone mailed me this picture recently because they put this in a journal article, but there's the work that John and I did way at the top. And you're probably familiar with all these other devices. And I don't want to have a long discussion about them. My only sort of highlight is why in the 25 years, they basically, the only thing that really changed was they just sort of let the video conferencing tools work better with better bandwidth and connectivity. There's not a lot of exploration of design uh, styles. Uh, this was some work where we said, this is actually from uh, my thesis where it showed, hey, you know, maybe you'll have remote repair inspection. We thought, what about just having your tarot cards read out on Telegraph Avenue, some social situations? We speculated there might be tablets that you would use. Like, um, and then this is kind of typical literature now. So this project was really cool. And it was a lot of fun to work on. And also, it opened up a lot of questions about how people might build these kind of systems. The question was, where the heck did this idea come from? Where did we get it from? And it was actually, when I thought back, it was actually inspired more from an art project that Andy Warhol had done called Silver Clouds. It's not a sort of scientist. He basically, you could still see this if you go to the Andy Warhol Museum in Pittsburgh. But there's these mylar balloons. They kind of float around like silver clouds. It was also inspired by a project that another pair of artists, Kit Galloway and Sherry Rubinowitz did, which was set up a video link between New York and Los Angeles in 1980. No, nobody could do this. I know this is basically just opening up Skype at now, but nobody could do this back in 1980 except television networks. No one had access to a live satellite feed to do that kind of thing. And they just let people hang out. And it's really interesting because they got the scale right of how people would interact. It was really interesting to see how people started to meet and do things. And it was just a really cool art project. Now, another project that we did was thinking about how the robot could be a person. And so this was taking that telepresence, but saying, what if a person or a teleactor um, you could control? So you could basically give this person commands and say, could you walk over? Can you pick that up? Can you uh, ask that person if uh, I can have their business card? You could control this person. And with one of the iterations, you would have an actual kind of crowd interface. So people would vote on the next thing, like, go purchase those flowers, go talk to that person, things like that. And uh, it's, this was work that we did kind of collaboratively with uh, actually Ken Goldberg was involved with this. It's not that different than things we see now on uh, you know, FaceTime Live and Twitter Periscope, where people are basically directing you to move around collectively. The point was, when we did this, it was also a very eerie experience. And you, this was actually, I went to South by Southwest in 2012 and encountered this guy who said, hi, I'm the South by Southwest proxy bot. And you could actually log into him, and then you could be at South by Southwest. So there's a ton of ethical issues. There's lots of strange things that go on. But I thought, where did this idea come from? This one came from. I think this uh, early work that Stanley Milgram, the same Stanley Milgram that did these obedience to authority experiments, he had set up his last experiment before he died, these things called serenoids, named after Sereno de Bergerac, where he basically set up people to send kind of information through a wireless connection to other individuals and have them speak for them. And you've seen this done on all kinds of kind of game shows and, and things now. But he was interested in how people perceive visual uh, perceptions of people versus what they're saying. And it really got me thinking about this idea of, well, if you don't know if this is, are you really talking to this person or to this person? This idea of authenticity and what's real. What's the kind of epistemological uh, you know, philosophy that's at stake when you're looking at this? One project we did on the side to try to address this as an art piece was this project called Legal Tender, where we put out sort of purportedly authentic $100 bills 
that you could log in through the web, you could give up your anonymity, and then you could go in and you would be given a very unique sort of patch and you could perform experiments to test whether or not this was a real bill. So you could puncture the bill, you could burn the bill, you could put acid on the bill, you could do all these different tests and you get nice before and after photos of what it would happen. You're also reminded that doing so, if it's a real bill and it's an actual real experiment, that it's actually a criminal activity, it's a felony, and you can be put into jail for this. And so you're kind of, we set up this intentional thing that is a kind of almost a telly crime. You're committing a criminal act. Um, so it was, it was fairly controversial at the time. It, it actually, we showed this again at the SIGGRAPH Art Show and then a couple other places. It's coincidental that uh, uh, you invited me to the talk because they just asked me to reshow this. There's an opening next week in San Francisco at the, the luggage store gallery where we're reshowing this piece. But again, I'm finding this connection of the projects that I work on connected to artists or finding a venue that's connected to asking a scientific question, asking something in, in art. So as Bjorn mentioned, I also worked at, at Intel Research doing kind of work in urban computing. And I see this same pattern. So we're really looking at trying to deconstruct urban spaces and look for opportunities to, for technology to emerge on these landscapes. Uh, do we do a bunch of different projects that have all kinds of different forms? There some have more technological kind of manifestations. Some are more uh, kind of working with the street furniture. Um, one of them that uh, also Bjorn mentioned in the intro was this idea of familiar strangers. Again, just people that are strangers to you, but they're familiar. You see them all the time. It's the guy that's always on the street corner. It's the, the woman that's walking her dog. It's the, the child that has that skateboard. There's people that are familiar. And I'm not going to go into the details about the project, it, but it was um, we did some really interesting early work in exploring how you could extend this relationship of familiar stranger. Um, it also asked some questions about why you're not going to be friends with everybody in the future. Like, how can you have technology connect to other relationships that aren't always about meeting up and being friends, but still giving you a sense of visibility and a sense of uh, um, connection with your um, fellow kind of citizens. And it, it inspired a lot of other technology. So the folks that made Foursquare and some and later um, other technology said that was really inspirational for them designing the kinds of tools that are there. Now again, I thought, now where did this project come from? And again, it was, of course, Stanley Milgram had also worked on this as an early study, looking at familiar strangers. This is a picture from his early studies. He's looking at people at a train platform. Part of the study was re-asking people um, who they remembered after these photos were taken. So a couple weeks later, he would go back and ask them. I thought, I don't even know if people actually do this anymore because we're so busy looking down at our phones. Do we notice the people around us? So we literally just repeated the experiment. We actually got similar numbers to Milgram. We did some other variations. But um, this Milgram character, who's now come up a couple times, um, it ends up, I started doing some digging about him. And at some point, he had to fill out a passport application. Now, he is a psychologist. Many of you probably know him. He's done a number of experiments. He's also controversial. Uh, he was uh, faculty at Yale and at Harvard. And it had this little box that I don't think they have as much anymore. It said, what's your profession? And he did not write professor. He wrote down artist in this box on his, patent, on his, on his uh, passport application. I wish he was alive. I would love to ask him more about this intriguing answer he gave. But that's what, that's what he did. So again, there's this connection. Um, and then there's, of course, really amazing artwork, such as Vito Conchi, who has an art piece you're all welcome to perform yourself. Uh, and so Vito says this piece called uh, Following Peace, find a stranger in public and follow them until they go into a private space. So I will not bail you out of jail if you get arrested doing this, but you can try this. Um, but it's interesting how a very simple social phenomenon, um, we kind of say that doesn't matter. We don't, why, are, why are you looking at this strange phenomenon? But in fact, this is also what HCI researchers do. We're really we're critical observers of the world and our society. And we try to look for opportunities to kind of understand human nature and design around it. All right, the, the last project in this series was this idea around not just telepresence, but other ways of communicating at a distance or even <coughs> somewhat co-located. And, and it was at the time where people were starting to send picture messages and emojis. I know that sounds like that could be a million years ago. But 
Uh, what other ways do people communicate besides making phone calls or texts? And so we went out to a farmer's market and just observed people and watched how they sent cues to each other without saying things. So the subtle touch, uh, the nudge, a kind of glance. And you do this if you arrive at a party, right? You kind of see someone across the way, like you're kind of, I'm going to talk to you later. You just kind of get an eye for them. Now, again, I'm not going to go into the details. It ended up that we had some access to sen sensor net technology at the time out of Berkeley, right? So this is part of the commotes that were being developed and looking at interesting topologies around wireless sensor networks, power management, new routing protocols, all these kinds of things. We thought, well, what if we took this and built this into a, a kind of watch form factor? And what if we put some different sensing and we let people have some communication using that? This is a little kind of video of what that looked like. Excuse the gratuitous Intel logo, which I did work at Intel at the time. Uh, so the idea was that you would tap on this device and it would send a little vibration to the remote person. The other mode was you would stroke across it and it would warm up or cool down, depending on the direction that you were sort of moving it in. And the last one, you would hold it down and it would capture your heartbeat. There were actually watches that did that at the time. And then you would sort of get the sense of the heartbeat remotely. I was told at the time, this is a stupid idea. Stop doing this. This is really dumb. Nobody wants this. Other things happen later. So it's basically the same thing that happened with real touch. And so um, a lot of people did get it. We did publish the work, obviously, and things happened with it. But the idea that sometimes these ideas seem a little bit unusual, that doesn't clearly fit into the context of the time, but people will start to develop languages around other modes and means uh, or other media that they can communicate across. So the way that now we can send messages through these other channels, um, people develop those languages. One thing was people didn't like this design because they felt this doesn't have any meaning. So if I send you the message, I'll be home at 5, that means I'm going to be home at 5. Or if I call you, they're like, what in the world? It's just tapping? That's the, what is that going to mean? Whereas it was clear, at least to us at the time, that people developed languages around this. And, but some people had trouble when they said, you need to complete the whole narrative. And we really pushed back against that. And I think that was also inspired by another artist that I, uh, I really draw inspiration from, John Baldessari. Now, he talks about art, but I think sometimes this applies to pr things that we design. He says, the best way to make art is to intrigue and be a bit seductive. You just say, here's this and this, you figure it out. Now, that sounds like a, a punt, like you should, you're the designer, you should answer these things. But I think often we like when things have some ambiguity. We like adopting them and bringing them. It feels more personal. We develop stronger ways of communicating a relationship rather than if I explain everything to you. If you think even that goes back to kind of a originally, you know, I think computer scientists said, here's the official prescribed manual of how this operates and this is how you will use it. And of course, hackers came and, and sort of co-opted that. And that really was a celebratory moment, I think. So it got me thinking more about this kind of connection between art and between uh, engineering and science. And I thought of a couple other projects. And hopefully the, these will sort of also make this illustration clear. So Michael Neymark did a project in the this 1978 called the Aspen Movie Map. And this was basically, it's, it's a laser video disc. That's how cool this was. <clears throat> so the idea was you could walk around the city of Aspen, Colorado. It was a little touch screen. And you could actually um, just get this amazing experience of what you're looking at. Now, it made me think of some other things that we've seen more recently. Now, I'm not saying that if Michael had not made this, we would have never gotten Google Street View. That was going to happen anyway. I'm not making that argument. I'm saying Michael did this more as kind of an art piece to explore the idea of what it might feel like to walk around a city. It was funded by some government funding. And in fact, he got a, an award for that. He got one of these really great uh, Golden Fleece Awards. So for those of you that know, this is the, uh, of course, the most egregious waste of taxpayer dollars. So the US government, they stood up and they said, quit funding this. This is the stupidest thing. We don't need this technology. Nobody's going to ever want this. And there's this thing here. Uh, I mean, even the sort of setup was very similar. I got Michael to send me a picture of his setup. Um, the point is that. Often people start to question and explore a design space or a new technology before it becomes 
uh, ready for actually technology adoption. I'll just give you a couple more that you may or may not be familiar with. So Myron Kruger, another amazing computer scientist and artist, possibly kind of misunderstood, developed some really great interactions that are very akin to what we see in Sony iToy and in Microsoft Connect, where he's thinking about kind of whole body uh, sort of manipulative interactions in 1974. That's really amazing that he was, had this kind of exploration of that space. Um, and again, people couldn't quite figure out what this was about. Like, I don't know what, this doesn't really feel like computer science. I don't know what this is. It's, is it art? Is it some performance? But it's clear that it connects through a lineage to the things that we do now. I also do some work often with, a, I have a long history with survival research labs as a performance group in San Francisco that does sort of large scale mechanized shows with uh, kind of large scale robots. One device is this Vortex Cannon, which basically produces a, a sort of a shock wave of air that comes at you. It's used more as kind of to create spectacle and some tension during a show because it doesn't sort of hurt you, but it feels like a big pillow hitting you essentially. And we now see people like Disney Research looking at how that same technology can be used to kind of get a sense of mid-air sensations and feeling. The last one I'll give you is so timely, it's not even eh, worth making the, the point how timely it is. But Twitter itself came out of an activist art project. So basically, back in, in 2004, the, the Democratic National Convention and the Republican Convention were held. And this group, Institute for Applied Autonomy, made, the, made this project called Text Mob so that they could communicate on their mobile phones using a kind of community text messaging service. And they had to limit the character set. So they had a restricted you know, 140 characters that they were using. They did this. It was a really cool art piece. And a lot of people used it. But after the convention, those artists were sort of, we don't have a job. They ended up going to another company that ended up eventually becoming Twitter. And Twitter's sort of gone on the record saying, yeah, we, if, I don't know if you remember, but the, the whole lineage, they really came out of the kind of podcasting service that they were doing. And then these people came over and they said, maybe we'll do a thing called Twitter. And so there's a lot of lineage and a connection to that. Now, this thing about art and science, I, I find a lot of just sort of beauty when the synergy comes together. Um, there's, there's lots of examples. I hopefully will inspire you to look at some of your own interests outside of your kind of disciplinary domains for, your, for, for kind of inspiration. So I want to go back to uh, one of the groups that was really foundational was this Experiments in Art and Technology, EAT. One of the members, uh, we have people like Jean Tangley, we've got uh, Robert Rauschenberg, there's a long list of folks, but um, on the other side we have Billy Kluver. So who's Billy Kluver? So Billy Kluver, here's a picture of Billy Kluver, and yeah, he was this amazing scientist. He was at Bell Labs, uh, and he collaborated with these artists in New York. So this is a project Oracle that he did with Robert Rauschenberg, and he did this project with Andy Warhol. They worked together on this, and it's a much longer list than that. What's another cool thing about Billy Kluver? Go Bears! Cal grad, PhD from Berkeley, 1957. Actually here on the faculty very briefly too. Um, very cool that you know there's this kind of Berkeley lineage to him, but he really embodies this idea of coming together, of working on the sort of cutting edge science of the time, but also um, the art as well. Now, the English chemist uh, C.P. Snow wrote about this in this really great book, um, the, the Two Cultures, and this is a quote from it. It says, the clashing point of two subjects, two disciplines, two cultures, of two galaxies ought to produ produce creative chances. And I think all of us, I, I, hopefully, kind of this resonates, like this beauty of bringing together, for him, the two cultures were kind of humanities and science, but that, that's when great things happen. Uh, and really in, in interesting innovations occur. Uh, Marshall McLuhan talks about the role of art. I like this. He says, art, artists show us how to ride with the punch rather than taking a knockout on the chin. So sometimes just perceptually things are a little bit abrasive and rough and the artist kind of helps us ride with the punch. Now what about when this comes together in great ways? And I, I would claim that this was a really great uh, sort of synergy between these two. Another Cal grad too, it's Go Bears. Um, but let me go back a little bit further. 
So Ivan Sutherland, you're probably all, all familiar. He did Sketchpad, um, this amazing kind of first uh, exemplar of direct manipulation with a pen interface. And you could basically draw up all these dimensional diagrams. And you could do modeling. It, a lot of the things you'll see, you see from this are things that we have now, constraint-based design, object-oriented models, all these different things. He also went and later on in 1969 said, hey, uh, let me try to experiment with this idea about augmented reality. He sort of worked on this sort of Damocles to think about how you might experience objects kind of hovering in the air and you might interact with them. There were no Pokemon back there, but you had these little boxes. Now, he wrote about this, of course, like any good scientist. This is his paper uh, from 1964. Uh, it's called Sketchpad. There's all kinds of discussions about how this operates and all the applications. But in there, he talks about the role of art. He talks about how this could be used for animation, cartooning, storyboarding, all these kind of interesting things. Um, and again, I'm finding this interesting connection between art and uh, sort of science. The last character I want to kind of come back to, and I know there's a lot of familiarity with Mark Weiser, who really brought us you know, ubiquitous computing. He talked about this concept of computing across three platforms of the pad, the tab, and the board, which we have the pad and the tab. Now the board we're still sort of kind of working on a little bit. We have some versions of it. This is, it's funny because this is his sort of envisioned interaction in the future. I don't know, that looks a lot like my living room sometimes, right? Probably like you guys as well. He was asked to give a keynote talk about this. I found the slides on the Wayback Machine. This is his actual slides from a uh, sort of big conference on uh, computing. And he says, how do you do these things, Mark? And he talks about you have to start from arts and humanities. And he's very clear about that. And this is the, at that time, he was holding the, he was the director of the computer science lab at Xerox Park. So here's a person who's really talking about to do these things right. I'm not going to tell you about power and networking. Those are important. We're going to do those. That's critical. But we're not speaking enough about these other issues. Now, uh, let me uh, say something more about design. And then I want to tell you about some, some other projects. So design is a lot of things that we do here uh, at Berkeley. And I claim all of us are designers. Because if you basically devise some course of action aimed at changing some existing situation into a preferred one, you're a designer. Okay? You, you got dressed today. You chose some clothing. You design, you're a designer. Okay? Now, well, the cool thing about design is some of the problems that we're facing now are not easily solved by traditional engineering methods. I mean, if we want to build a, a bridge, or we want to build particular infrastructure that has certain quality metrics, then we need to employ those, those methods. But something like problems like famine and healthcare, uh, things like uh, education, the environment, these are what we call wicked problems. These are sort of problems that are very hard to define. The solutions often introduce their own side effects and problems. Um, actually, the, the term was coined by Horace Riddle, who was actually in the College of Environmental Design here at Berkeley, so another Berkeley alum. And I didn't set this up to be all about Berkeley. It just so happens it's a great place. Um, so I don't want to do this slide. Um, I want to talk about another element of design called critical design, where often when you design something, there's this present state, and there's this kind of end state. And I would say we often talk about this, there's this whole range of possible things that could happen. The second range is the plausible things that are kind of more plausible. That's really what's going to happen. And maybe even inside of that, that's probably what's going to happen. We're, you know, we're going to get different levels of you know, augmented reality. We're going to get more kind of smart watches. These are probable. What critical do design postulates is maybe there's this preferable, there's something we can pivot and do something a little more, something different in that landscape. And so sometimes these seem a little bit obtuse, but they're still within the realm of sort of possible interactions. Now, I had done some work in, uh, with some collaborators looking a lot at citizen science, how sort of devices could help people come together, in this case, sample air quality, uh, collectively kind of crowd-based um, resources. The point was to really think more about how people can explore and be curious and question things around the world 
more and around their environment more than they were doing traditionally. So maybe rather than always looking down at your phone, you're using it to kind of sample, collect, use that information for decision makers. I'm not going to go into all of the projects that, that happen in this space, but point out that they have this broad range. Some of them are phone-based, some of them are more physical devices, some are like new kinds of clothing that you wear, some of them are things that attach to other vehicles. One thing that we found out early on was there, there was no way to really do really uh, good quality uh, air, air sampling um, at low cost. And so there were devices we were using, and you can go get much, much higher end equipment, but at least this is the kind of lower end of the range. Uh, you know, and these are devices that sample the number of particles in the air, which is actually what you really want to sample, as you know, from about, what was it, a week or two ago when we were in this horrific air quality. It wasn't the ozone, it was the particles. Um, and so what we did uh, really, so Kevin, one of my graduate students, went out and sort of re-engineered part of this at, at a lower cost because we wanted to get to a different form factor so that we could also play with different designs. And we, but we wanted something that would maintain the same quality control. And so thinking about this as a wearable space, this was a sort of very small watch based. We have it here. This is what it looks like. Okay. Um, these are the sort of final designs. Yes, I know it doesn't look as sort of sexy as your Apple Watch, but it's pretty darn cool. And the engineering that went into it is amazing that you can wear this and all day sample the air. And also it interacts with your mobile device. The point is, once you have these technologies, you have a different lens. You have a different way of looking at your world. And you actually can map it differently. You can sample things. Uh, we did some experiments to see how well that actually worked. And we had amazing agreement with really much higher end equipment. So we were on the right track. We showed this to a bunch of folks at the EPA. We published the work. And, and we also got to explore other form factors. So what happens when these aren't devices that look like uh, for adults? So for example, what if we have uh, little airplanes that sample the air when kids are playing. They kind of invite that into their narrative. What if you have water uh, sensors that are in sort of places where you can explore how your bath or the gutter or a lake are. Same thing with when you're digging. So how would that come into that kind of narrative? One of the things that I like to do with uh, my collaborators is make stuff. Um, and I'm going to stick with Barack Obama on this one. I'm sorry, I know we switched presidents, but I look back, I'm like, no, I like this slide. The maker movement is a revolution that could help us create new jobs and industries for decades to come and will create entire new industries that we can't yet imagine. I firmly believe that. I think there's a lot of cool things that will happen. Um, as you know, there's this really great maker space that uh, Bjorn and I, along with Paul Wright, started the Citrus Invention Lab about 2012. It's about 1,700 square feet. People move fast there, I'm telling you. It's a really fast place. Uh, and Chris Myers now helps uh, with, uh, as a manager there. Um, it's a really great space. It has a lot of great equipment. Um, I'm not going to try to tell you all the things that happened there. I'm just going to say that in the landscape of things, there's all the range from doing prosthetics like Sophie's hand to people doing startups like these crazy accent uh, wear headphones that let you kind of uh, explore different ways of playing with audio. We also, as you see, I brought a little prop here. And in fact, we have this idea that maybe the making follows you. You can't really, this is a lab that's open to all Berkeley students, staff, and faculty. You can come in. If you have a maker pass, you can use it. But what if you could take the making home? So we have these little GoFab printers now that you can take away. You can now print at home. You can print uh, you know, at a cafe. There I am at Cafe Strata. Um, maybe that'll be a common site um, in the future. But anyone can use these. So please come and you can, as long as you have a maker pass, you can check them out and you can use them. You all know about Jacobs Hall. It's our, it's our sort of the neighbor here. And this was a, a chance to really scale up design, scale up making, think about new ways of pedagogy around integrating disciplines in engineering um, and computer science with these ideas of digital fabrication, prototyping, um, and iterative design where we can test things. So one of the things I do there is we look on this class critical making. We think a lot about different designs. And one of the challenges is to think about new kinds of wearables. And these were just from a class. But the range is kind of interesting what students kind of start to dig into. This was a student that wanted to make a dress that pushed people away when they got too close to her. She felt like two people were just crowding her all the time. So she would just push them away with this interactive dress. 
This is a project that was uh, to make people aware of sexual harassment. So when, it, when they were near places that it occurred, it would kind of, they would feel this vibration is warming as they kind of moved by. This is a kind of inflatable, this is looking at new materials. Sometimes we just explore other kinds of, uh, again, basically materials. This is a growing different kinds of, what if you have organic things, you have to nurture your clothing. So they were looking at like what would happen if you could do that. This idea of what if you had clothing that protected your identity? So this looks, and if you're near cameras and things, it kind of occludes your eyes. This is a very dystopian kind of clothing. This was an idea around casts for kids. They say you, they break their arm. They just put this cast on. What if the cast had cool attachments and it helped, like they could look at their imaginary bone and it could heal and they could sort of start to kind of play with it. Um, this was a, a really cool ring that would kind of have better communications around celebrating sexual consent. And then this was, yeah, this is, I actually was barely breathing in this. But this was, I, I just want to raise the issue that often students, they, they present these really provocative projects that they have you know, some technical interactive elements, but they're also addressing other issues. This was really about depression and what it feels like when you're depressed and you're sort of enclosed. And there was, it's a much bigger piece. I'm just showing you this because I look like I'm about to pass out, which I almost was. I also challenge them to think about uh, protests. How, what kinds of new objects might someone design around a protest? Obviously, it was topical at the time. And people looked at um, developing different ways that people would feel unity. People would actually be able to experience the event and take home a memory. Um, or this object here, which was just an interactive object they thought would be around a space. You would touch it, and it would tell you stories about uh, where people had experienced some kind of sexual harassment. I said, what about mobility? We had an assignment looking at mobility. And this is people rethinking kind of a little bit of tug and cheek of Uber as a kind of rickshaw service, but thinking about labor issues. And then looking at age demographics, so how kids might have these new interactive tools or people that are octogenarians. The cool thing is and there's now a design certificate, so folks that really are interested in this topic can go take some courses and get an actual certificate in design. Now, we also do research in making, so we think about how we can design new internal uh, elements inside of objects that create different deformabilities, different kinds of centers of mass, so we can create objects that do different things. Uh, Joanne, one of my students, looked at this project uh, that's shrinky dinks, or sh basically it's like shrinky dinks, that's why it's called shrinky circuits. It's pre-stretched polystyrene. But we realized that you could sketch on this material, you could lay out traces, and then you could heat it up. And for those of you that remember from your childhood, it shrinks down and it also becomes rigid, so you basically could have more uh, ways to interact with it. I'm going to go because I want to show you some of the wearable stuff. I will, I will tell you about this wearable scoping, which we're, we're calling cosmetic, uh, not cosmetic, yeah, cosmetic computing. The idea is that we can take this opportunity in wearables and rather than saying, let's just have new technologies that already reinforce the kinds of stereotypes we have around clothing, what if we use it as a way to celebrate uh, diversity of uh, body types and gender norms and all these things. And so it's really trying to think broadly about what wearables could be. Now we all know wearables, so you might have a phone, you have a smartwatch or a Fitbit, and we're trying to think of a wider landscape. So one of the things we got to do early on uh, in a collaboration with Google was think about how we could have conductive traces that they were looking at how it would be used for a, a touch, kind of a uh, capacitive touch interaction, which they've now developed into a project, or sorry, an actual product called the Jacquard. It's a jacket that you can wear and interact with. We looked at how it could change clothing um, as a thermochromic device. So you can see it's sort of changing its, its uh, display there. And the idea was, well, what if your clothing changed throughout the day? Right now, you basically always put on the same thing, but what happens if you wanted it to change and what if you could have the opportunity to change styles, you could have messages, you could have all kinds of different things. The other project that we looked at was the skin. So what if this is the world, not world, the, the human, the largest organ on the human body. What if you could actually have skin that actually had new abilities? So in this case, 
We developed tattoos from temporary tattoo paper. We used pretty standard methods. So you can do this with high-end equipment. We intentionally challenged ourselves to say, could we do this with standard silk screening and the tools that we have in the lab? And what we ended up with is a really low-cost way to embed uh, capacitive and resistive uh, sensing as well as uh, strain gauges. So now your skin becomes this really interesting interactive material and you can also send signals to it so you could send uh, back to the referencing from before the secret heartbeat you could send to someone. The idea is we're starting to see this landscape emerge that's beyond just traditional kind of wrist-based devices. So we're thinking, let's build out this kind of landscape. And one of them is we're thinking about these fingernails. This is a project that christie has been looking at. Uh, what if you had fingernails that had an e-ink and they actually were inductively charged so that if you interacted with devices largely that um, uh, had communication infrastructure like RFID or something, you could actually, as you touch things, or even if I put my hand near my phone, it could not only charge but put information on it. So you'd actually have something different. So I might put my hand down, I know whatever, I got a message coming through or things are happening. The cool thing is you don't actually have to power it. So who wants to sit around and charge their fingernails, right? So it doesn't need any power. Hair. I don't have any hair, but hair is a pretty cool opportunity to think about. Um, this is another project that chrissy has been thinking a lot about uh, with some of my other students, uh, Molly and Sarah. And it's, you touch your hair in interesting ways, and she's been thinking about how you can categorize the types of touch and sort of figure out what that means. So tugs and pulling and twisting, so using some very standard uh, sort of feature extraction techniques to figure that out and then to get the hair to actually also express itself. So it can move uh, and it can also change color. So changing shape and changing color. Now you can do that for getting notifications or your hair becomes this kind of display, but also you can feel things. So if we move your hair in certain ways, you can actually get a little haptic sensation uh, like where your ear is. You can also say, I'd like to change my hairstyle and you can just change your hairstyle by, I don't know, tapping on your phone, for example. Uh, the other idea is, well, what if you have clothing that you can actually change very similar to those fingernails, but it's actually sort of these screen-based devices that, again, has e-ink, so now you can almost imagine writing information onto your clothing. And so you see a sense of what that is. You know, of course, you could have that in other things. This is in a, in a hat. You could have shoes. You could have all kinds of different objects. We're just interested in explaining what that means to have clothing and materials that changes over time. So it says catverse rather than converse on it. So this just, we just had this uh, paper uh, that accepted to the TEI conference, which was really cool. The last thing that's pretty exploratory is uh, a newer student I'm Molly's looking at kind of this idea of kinetic clothing. When, when clothing actually starts to move and perform and do various actions. Some of this is using some magnetic properties, some of it's using others. Some of it is us questioning what the actual mechanism is and trying to, but also what will that mean when your clothing can move and deform and do things? How do you communicate things? She has a background in sort of puppeteering and it's really lending towards uh, that. In conclusion, I would say uh, go take your students out. We had a cool field trip where we left when it was the, the death day of don't go outside and we fled in our masks and we ran off to SF MoMA and we just had a great day hanging out there. It's Molly sort of checking out one of the art pieces there. Um, and I'll end there. So thank you for your time. And I do have other demos, but I didn't get to everything. So thank you. Time for a couple of questions, and I'll bring the mic to you. Uh, so this is very interesting, especially with the uh, blimp. Uh, now, uh, in robotics, I don't know why our robotics should have legs. Uh, it makes much more sense for the robotics to be uh, unmanned aerial vehicles. Than it, but it, the unmanned aerial vehicle has a slight drawback. If you want to lift any weight, you've got to continuously put energy into it, and it, it quickly becomes uh, prohibitive. But with the blimp, uh, you've, get, you've got that feature too, plus you, you uh, fly around. It, it, it's actually a useful unna unmanned aerial vehicle because it can go around and do, do a lot of stuff. It, it's, it's, it's better robotics. Why hasn't the whole robotics field converged on that? <laughs> well, there is a whole kind of field around soft robotics, and it has that kind of 
same feeling of things that you can kind of easily manipulate. From an HCI standpoint, imagine a flying drone with propellers coming at you, it's more this is what you're doing. A blimp, if you don't want to talk to you, you just kind of hit it, right? It just sort of yeah. flies away. That's an important kind of interaction. Um, but I'll give you an example. Sure. We had a, a, a talk at uh, noon today over in Citrus, and it was a guy in a robotics company, and their business model was that uh, they would have uh, sort of butlers in hotels, and instead of sending someone up and tipping them, uh, you have the robot coming and giving you your uh, whatever you ordered. Uh, so uh, the uh, yeah, it, it had legs, it has wheels, it, it was such a mess. I mean. Uh, you, it's obviously much more adaptable and flexible if it floats around. Right. I, I think it's more, well, you, you understand. I mean, carrying heavy loads, it's something that it doesn't adapt to. But I, I definitely felt a kind of beauty in the simplicity of this kind of floating. It has a poetry to it, for sure. And the way it moves is also not threatening from at least a, a human-robotic interaction standpoint. It's pretty important. I'm just worried about how much you can actually lift quite a bit of weight uh, with something that is filled with helium. Yeah, you could lift more. Yeah, you can. The point is, at some point, it gets so large that then it's not easy to navigate down a hallway. Or now people are, it's actually stuck in the hallway, right? But yeah, no, there's it's, there's very cool things. I, I do love that project, and I like that aesthetic of having things floating. Um, yeah, thank you for that. So when did you start your blimp work? Oh, uh, that 91 or something? I don't know. So you know when, when I was in Santa Cruz, we had uh, Stanford and Berkeley NVA, I guess. So we built a 40-foot helium-filled banana slug and flew it into the big game. <laughs> and initially, I wanted to have it remote controlled so it could just hover over the stadium. Uh, it was too expensive, but also I was afraid that uh, the headlines would re read, students mauled by giant flying banana slug. So we did it with a pulley system. But it was, um, I, uh, I think there's something there. And I think eventually th we're going to be able to trans, I mean, there were all this work done on being transferring um, cargo and things to remote areas using blimps. Um, and I think it's not dead yet. But I found that what you did very interesting, just floating around. And uh, whatever happened to that research project? I mean, we. A thesis? I graduated? I don't know. Yeah. No, I mean, we published a bunch of things on that. And I think it was, uh, we started asking questions, as I alluded to, that we wanted to study different kinds of human interactions that were focused on tasks that was hard to have a blimp hovering over. But it worked great for a lot of things. It was amazing to go like in a museum space or float around. I think, actually, to be totally fair, I, it was also inspired by Alan Kay, who at the time did this vivarium project at MIT. He was interested in what if things floated around in a building, you felt like you're in like an aquarium, but it was a vivarium and you were part of it. And it wasn't a telepresence aspect, but it was a very cool aesthetic. I was drawn to that aesthetic. So you're right, and Google's back, there's a bunch of things back on blimps and floating around. Well, also, when you think about them coming together collectively, there could be yeah. some interesting opportunities. So yeah, come. We'll come play with blimps. I love that stuff. So I still have all those, but there's newer, newer technology to let you do that. I have a question for you. So uh, you mentioned how you know, with the watch interaction, you got pushback at the time. And, and then maybe it took another decade and a half um, for the rest of the technology cultural environment to be ready to pick that up. How do you know at the time, or do you know at the time, whether you have something that, you know, is actually, is off in the implausible, or it's in the plausible cone and you have, you have an intuition that the rest of technology and society will come along and, and pick it up. So how much of a radar can you develop for, for judging um, yeah, the plausibility, feasibility in, in the future? No, yeah, that's a good question. Because often, these are easy stories to tell in retrospect. They're very hard in the moment. Um, I actually felt at that one, I could tell people were going to have meaning in other. I, I, from just that, I had done the prop work, and I knew 
There was, it, there was video, there was audio, there was gesture, there was gaze, there was posture. I knew, I was like, all these channels are important. I was like, oh, people are going to use other channels like tap and brush and, you know, all these kind of other tactile kind of experiences. I, I'm like, that's going to happen. Um, also, because I saw the way people were starting to use emojis as a language. I know that's like so obvious now, but very early people were like, what does that mean, Apple, Apple, whatever, right? And so I thought, oh, there'll be a language around touching. Now, it might not be universal. Maybe it's between you and friends, you and a partner, you and sort of a, just a collective group. But to be fair, what's interesting is the, the prototypes were hard to make. We, we made only, I mean, we had the sort of small scale looks like that did the, did the sensing, but the actuation, we had like a clumsy box. I mean, we, didn't, we couldn't make the real thing. Um, and so it was more, we postulate this is how the experience will feel and this is what people will do. We never ran it at scale to really collect data and say here's how people would, because all these things over time, people would have to emerge with new um, languages they develop. I think it's really hard to basically tell if it's the right thing at the time. I, that one I felt, this is definitely going to happen, but in the interest, I wanted to move on. I didn't want to sit and do that for five or six years. I just wanted to move on to something. But I think that one made more sense. But there's, there's ones that don't make sense. Well, may, maybe as a follow-up, what's, uh, what's your favorite idea that you developed <laughs> and that just the rest of the world never came around to, to pick it up? I know. Someone asked me that recently, too, because well, the, one of the weird things was I, I, mean, I mentioned that, that tele-actor thing. I'll tell you something that was a very bad idea with that, which was we originally thought that you would actually you would actually almost feel more like you took over the person's body. Like you would actually, we had a speaker in their mouth and they would be speaking at it. It was very creepy and I can tell very wrong. That was a bad idea at the time. So we make a lot of mistakes. I don't know why we thought that, but um, yeah, I don't, that's a very good question. I need a better answer for that. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. All right. One more question over here. It's not a, it's just an observation. Um, you were watch methodology looks like it has gone much further now like recently like about a week back i saw the glucose meter right on halo or whatever the company wristwatch and so i think did you make some patterns on that one did <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, I know. I mean, some of these things we don't, some things we patented. Actually, just we, like the, all the blips and props, we submitted patents, but Berkeley at the time said we're not interested in patenting this. That was a little bit of a bummer because we could have done something with that. Um, but we didn't do, we were not actually looking. So those glucose monitors and things are really important for kind of health and well being and monitoring. One of the things was once you, once you expose that information to people, like, if you're driving a Prius and you, or a car, it tells you how many miles per gallon, then you start adjusting your driving. If you could see how many step counts, then you start to change your behavior. And that's what a lot of these, there's these incentivized uh, value that comes from that. And so we didn't ever do things with glucose, mainly because that's, that's hard to control. It's not like I can say, I'm sending you my glucose information now. Um, it would be interesting from, a pro from the perspective that maybe you're informed of how I'm doing. Am I taking my medication? What have I been eating? Am I balancing? But, um, and that's an interesting awareness you can give to the, the something that's more intimate. You might not share that kind of publicly, but I think those are really interesting questions, what happens. It's very clear when sensing and these technologies shrink, that's often going to be obvious. So even all these things we develop, they look a little clumsy in the time because they're usually 10, 20 years out. But we're trying to get at the fundamental like human experience. Like, what would it mean to share your heartbeat? What would it mean to tap someone remotely just very subtly? Does that have any meaning? And we claim pretty strongly, like, yeah, that would people would have they would that would mean something to people. Um, but yeah, great, great, yeah, the glucose, it's, there's gonna be more sensing on the way, and that's part of the kind of research question we grapple with now with wearables and clothing. What will that feel like? What will the skin do? So help. Thank you. Great. On that note, thank you. All right. Thank you. So the thing I didn't talk about, you can come up and talk.